is going on guys and welcome to the third episode of the women series now if you've been following along then you know these videos do build on one another so make sure you watch the first two first and then come back to this one so you can follow along however if you have a basic understanding of human physiology and are familiar with hormones and their function then you may be just fine so as you can tell by the title we are going to be taking a look at some practical applications to manipulate some of the key hormones involved in weight loss. Now, after doing the research for this video, I wanted to limit this discussion to things that you could actually implement in your life right now, things that are realistic and without the use of drugs. However, when it comes to weight loss, the only things that are 100% foolproof are putting yourself in a caloric deficit, adherence, and of course, patience. However, there are a few things that could help you out a little bit to at least set yourself up for success. And since there's nothing inherently magical about putting yourself in a caloric deficit, I thought I would offer a few other tips to make the process a bit easier. So in my last video, I discussed testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, leptin, and the thyroid hormones. In this video, I'm going to predominantly focus on leptin and the thyroid hormones, as the others are a little bit more difficult to alter without exogenous drugs like steroids or birth control. Briefly, leptin is the anti-starvation hormone, which decreases when you start dieting. And you want this to be high because when it drops, it will signal to the brain that energy reserves are starting to get scarce and it will trigger a response that increases food intake, such as increasing hunger cues, all of which makes dieting more difficult. Surprisingly, this all happens actually really quickly. A study by Bowden and colleagues in 1996 showed that level levels of leptin started to decrease just after six hours of no food from the last meal in obese and non-obese controls. This was validated in a study in 1998 by Kemetol, where they had 12 healthy overweight women dieting on roughly a 670 calorie deficit. And this study demonstrated a 54% drop in leptin after just one week of dieting. Interestingly, there was no statistically significant difference of leptin levels from week one to week 12 which tells us that there's a drop in leptin pretty quickly and will remain low until calories are restored. Now, this is also seen with hormones of the thyroid, which have a huge role in regulating basal metabolic rate. These hormones also drop with energy restriction, which isn't surprising due to the fact that we know leptin drops when you diet, and a drop in leptin reduces thyroid-releasing hormone. Decreased thyroid-releasing hormone will then decrease its downstream effectors, TSH, T3, and T4. Collectively, this all contributes to the decrease in energy expenditure when you diet. Okay, so what? That's all great, but is there anything that you can do to prevent this from happening? Well, not really. But there are things you can do to prevent rapid drops in these levels, like really early in the diet, which will help to preserve these hormones as long as possible. And there are also things that you can do that'll keep you mentally happier, which can keep you less stressed during your diet. It'll also increase your chance that you will actually stick to the diet. Adherence is one of the biggest factors when it comes to weight loss. So let's jump into some practical application. My first recommendation is to be mindful of the rate at which you are losing weight. This will mitigate some drastic drops in leptin, TSH, T3, T4, as well as estradiol. And it's important to avoid crash dieting as it is not uncommon for females to experience amenorrhea or a loss of the menstrual cycle. And this happens from dieting too aggressively. A more modest weight loss will also prevent a drastic metabolic adaptation as you want to preserve your metabolic rate for as long as possible. A pretty popular study by Nuth et al. in 2014 compared people who lost weight through gastric bypass surgery and lost an average of about 90 pounds or 40 kilos in 12 months to those who competed in The Biggest Loser and lost about 105 pounds or 48 kilos in seven months. So both groups had large weight reductions, but The Biggest Loser group had lost it almost twice as fast. And this study showed that The Biggest Loser group not surprisingly had the greatest metabolic adaptation. This study also shows us that leptin, T3, and T4 remained higher in the gastric bypass group throughout the study compared to the biggest loser group, which had steeper drops in these levels. These results indicate a high association with the average rate of weight loss with the D 
decrease in leptin. Thus, it seems that in order to preserve metabolic rate and leptin levels, losing weight more slowly is optimal. My general recommendation is to lose about 1% of body weight per week. So for example, I weigh 125 pounds. So that would mean I would aim to lose about 1.25 pounds per week. So you can do the calculation to your own weight if you plan to start a cut. The next recommendation I have is implementing a periodic one to two day refeed, which is the strategic increase in calories specifically from carbohydrates slightly above maintenance or back to maintenance calories. And if you are unfamiliar, maintenance calories is simply the amount of food you could eat and not gain any weight or maintain. This increase is very modest, especially in women, but at the very least, it gives you more food without running the risk of derailing your progress. Because worst comes to worst, you just maintain your weight for a day or two and then get back to it. And I say carbohydrates specifically because in studies done where there is an energy restriction, carbohydrate feeding can rescue levels of leptin, where an increase in calories derived only from fat have almost no effect. And refeeds can also preserve levels of estradiol. TSH, T3, and T4, shown by a study in 1995 by Olson and colleagues demonstrating that after a three-day fast where these hormones were significantly decreased, bringing calories just back to maintenance levels was enough to restore these hormones. And I know that refeeds will only have acute changes on your hormone levels, but refeeds have often highly touted to have profound mental advantages, which is critical when you are dieting. Simply having more food during a refeed can give you a mental break and get you back on track for the remainder of your diet or until you have another refeed. And another dieting strategy that you could experiment with is that you can simply altogether take a diet break. A diet break is a period of time normally about one to two weeks of bringing your calories back to maintenance levels. And this differs from a refeed due to its longer duration, which can have longer lasting effects of restoring hormones, as well as giving you enough of a mental break, especially if a refeed isn't cutting it. And in addition to the hormonal benefits, diet breaks have been shown to have metabolic benefits, which was recently demonstrated in a 2018 study by Byrne and colleagues. This study split obese male subjects into two groups. One group dieted continuously, while another group had intermittent diet breaks, which were two week periods throughout the diet that they would bring calories back up to maintenance. While there were some drawbacks to having diet breaks, such as having to diet for longer, there were also some noteworthy positive effects namely improved weight loss and significantly less metabolic adaptation in the group that took diet breaks. Additionally, the diet break group was also even more successful at keeping the weight off long-term in the follow-up studies. Therefore, this study shows us that a diet break can be a useful tool that you could experiment with. And the next tip may seem pretty obvious, but with our crazy lives and constant distractions, it's easy to leave this on the back burner. And that is simply getting enough sleep. It's probably no surprise that this could have dramatic effects on your weight loss goals. Self-reported sleep of less than six to seven hours per night is associated with increased incidence of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and total mortality risk. A 2014 review paper observing the metabolic effects of sleep disruption reported less sleep is associated with decreased leptin and higher ghrelin, which is an appetite stimulating hormone. And this combination leads people to overeat. And I'm sure that telling you to get a solid eight hours a night of sleep is not revolutionary by any means, but it's probably safe to throw a little reminder at you. Also, when I was preparing for this video, I was kind of posting about it on my IG story, I got a lot of messages from women telling me that they had hypothyroidism. So I briefly wanted to mention that from the research out there on this, there is sadly no gold standard hypothyroidism diet. Although there are claims to be, there's no current evidence to my knowledge in the literature that eating or avoiding certain foods will improve thyroid function in people with hypothyroidism. Of course, adequate dietary iodine is essential for normal thyroid function but this is not really an issue in developed countries as it is supplemented in salts and some foods. So my recommendation for those who have hypothyroidism or for people who want to ensure good thyroid health is to avoid any dietary extremes, which I guess is just good advice in general. And the last recommendations aren't directly related to hormones, but I think they're very important when you are dieting and I thought I'd throw them in this video. So one being to make sure you are getting sufficient 
protein, which helps you hold on to that muscle that you worked so hard for. I generally recommend one gram per pound of body weight per day. And lastly, make sure you are resistance training. Nothing dietarily, not even tons of protein, will preserve muscle loss from dieting as much as simply putting tension on the muscle. So don't forget that. All right, guys, that was a lot of information. I will put up a summary slide so that you can screenshot it and keep it in your back pocket if you are or are thinking about dieting. And I know I've mentioned this before, but if you're interested in reading more in depth on all of these topics, I highly recommend the women's book by Lyle McDonald. I do get a lot of my inspiration for these topics of the videos. So I highly recommend this if you wanna do more in depth reading on this kind of stuff. There will be a link in the description box below. So that is going to conclude this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it. If you are enjoying the women's series, drop me a like so I know that you guys like the sciencey stuff. These are a few highly requested video topics I have coming up for this series. But as always, please, please, please leave topics you would be interested in the comment section below. That is all I have for you. Subscribe if you are new and make sure to check out the videos I have floating around my head and click that notification bell so you know when I post another video. I love you all so much and until next time. Bye.